Hi, and welcome back to another lecture of uh, the F110 Autonomous Racing online course. So in today's lecture, I'm going to focus on talking about the uh, hardware aspects or the build of the actual uh, one-tenth vehicle. And I know that this online uh, video series, uh, we, are only be, we are only going to be using the uh, F110 ROS simulator, and we'll walk you uh, in a subsequent video on how to install that simulator and also how uh, the simulation works uh, in ROS Gazebo. But I do think that before going on into the simulator and uh, how the different sensors operate, what different data do we use for the perception planning and control aspects of uh, the F110 autonomous racing stack, uh, I, I thought it would be a good idea uh, to go through the hardware build of the car because the simulator is trying to mimic uh, the real world and minimize this simulation to reality gap. So, so even though we won't be utilizing the real F110 car, uh, like the one you see just behind me, uh, I, I do think you know this will give you an appreciation for the build and you will better understand how the car functions and uh, uh, how it operates in the simulation down the line. So, so, so this is a little bit off topic, but we are now transitioning from learning about ROS into now learning about uh, the actual 110 scale autonomous racing car, which is what this course is all about. And in doing so, the idea is to teach you the principles of perception, planning, and control algorithms, which go behind uh, autonomous driving and autonomous racing. Right, so, so we are now transitioning from uh, going from autonomous turtles, which you have programmed in your previous uh, assignment of this course, uh, to learning about autonomous cars. And if you are able to uh, control autonomous turtles, controlling autonomous cars is uh, uh, very, very similar. Uh, and then we will do uh, not just learn about controlling any autonomous car, but in particular, this course will emphasize on uh, autonomous racing cars. And we'll add that aspect of, uh, you know, why is racing difficult or what additional challenges does it pose to, to self-driving. So just to give you uh, a quick glimpse of, uh, here is a, a, a picture from, um, from last year in my lab. And as you can see, uh, we have almost more than 20 110 scale vehicles in my lab. So we have literally like a fleet uh, of uh, 110 scale autonomous race cars. Um, they are all very similar looking. Some of them in the background are a little bit different. You can even see they have an arrow wing. Uh, and you know, that's just uh, what some of my students uh, uh, have a laser cut and built themselves to give them this feel of like a Formula One car. Uh, but most of the cars uh, in the in the center of this image are very similar to uh, the same car that I have uh, here with me at my residence. Um, uh, and you know, I'm going to walk you through how this was put together, what are the different components, uh, and so eventually down the line, you know, the build of this car is open source. So if you have the resources to put together one of these, you can do it uh, on your own. We have very extensive uh, build instructions that, that walk you through uh, every step uh, of what is needed. To, to get this car uh, out of the box with different components, put it together, and, and also install the software on board. So, so with that in mind, let's try to learn about the uh, hardware aspects of F110. Uh, and this is one of the, I would say, four main ingredients uh, that we will touch in this course on F110. Right? We will definitely talk about the chassis design and the hardware aspects of it today. Uh, then the bulk of the, the module will focus on integrating information from the sensors and learning about the software architecture, which is the perception, planning, and control. Uh, and then we will also learn about uh, our simulation tool, uh, which would be either hosted in the cloud or you can install it on your VM, and we'll release instructions for that shortly. But today it's all about uh, looking at the at the chassis design itself. And so we'll just focus on the first aspect, right? So the course is about build, drive, and race. So now uh, this is going to be a pretty short video because I don't have a real car to uh, walk you through as we would have if this was being held in person, but this will give you a pretty good uh, idea of the hardware aspects of the build of the car. Um, bear in mind, this is a true for any race car, not just F110, it's always, uh, a prototype, right? So there's never a moment where teams would be very happy with what they have put together and they're like, okay, now we can freeze our design. There's always room to improve it further. In our case, uh, you know, initially these cars were, were put together by uh, students much like yourself in the undergraduate course that I teach here at UVA. 
Um, and this was, I would say, the V1, the first version. And you can see in some of these pictures, we have provided them with these uh, pre-cut, uh, laser-cut ABS uh, puzzle pieces, if you will, or IKEA-style pieces. And then they're just, you know, fitting them together um, uh, and during a lab session in the class. So, um, so we cannot do that this year, but nonetheless, you know, uh, there's, there's that element of how do you learn to build the car uh, and so I, I want to touch upon that element by at least teaching you about what the build is, um, is uh, what, what it takes to build this car and put it, all, put it together on your own and what are the different components and their key roles. And our, our philosophy has always been that this F110 is one tenth the scale, but it's 10 times the fun, as I've said many, many times. Uh, and you know, it, it, it is an electric vehicle. It is a four wheel drive vehicle that uh, we also use. Uh, much like the full-scale counterpart, but you know it has different parameters. It has similar dynamics, not exactly the same dynamics. Uh, the two things which are not realistic on our car is braking is very different from how full-scale cars brake because we just brake by uh, you know duty cycling a motor. And the other thing which is not relevant, at least on the um, on the speeds and the scale at which we operate, is the aerodynamic effects. So uh, as I've said before, we use this uh, one ten scale rally car chassis, uh, which is available from the RC community. And um, this looks like an ordinary car, but you know this is a very serious uh, uh, piece of uh, equipment. It's not just your regular RC toy. It's capable of doing uh, insanely high speeds. So I think out of the box, this can go uh, in excess of 30 miles per hour outdoors, uh, which is extremely fast for a car of this size. Um, and so it's very realistic. It has the same sort of a setup that you would find on full scale race cars. It's meant to be configured as a race car. So you can you know, see uh, many of the uh, sort of the suspension design and the differential and the drive shaft um, and the adjustments that you can make to, uh, if you're familiar with racing, you can adjust things like the camber, the caster uh, and the toe of the car. So all of that is possible. Uh, with this 110 scale car so you can really get you know uh, deep into the racing element of uh, of just the hardware itself not even uh, talking about any software yet so in a nutshell the main elements that we are interested in are the the main uh, brushless dc motor we'll talk a little bit about the capabilities of these uh, uh, pieces in just a second but you know this is what provides drive to all four wheels it's a four wheel drive uh, through this uh, drive shaft, which runs through the middle of the chassis. Then there's a servo motor, which is meant to uh, steer the car, and it has an independent channel to control the servo inputs. Uh, there is a radio receiver, which comes built in, because this car is a remote control toy, so you, you know, need a way to accept commands from the manual handheld remote. Uh, and then all of this machinery, or sort of all of these electronics, I should say, are powered by uh, a high current, uh, high capacity LiPo uh, or nickel cadmium uh, battery pack. Uh, and so that powers all the electronics which uh, make this car a remote control car. Um, so here's how they are roughly located. You have a battery bay on one side, on one half, uh, and on the other half you have all the, uh, the motor and the receiver and the electronic speed controller. Uh, and you can see the weight is also evenly distributed uh, both horizontally and or I should say both longitudinally and laterally, right? So when you place the battery bank, it will uh, it will be act as a counterweight to all the motor and the electronic stuff on the other side. Um, then we, you know, we have to uh, add our own stuff to make this car autonomous. And uh, in a nutshell, we have to add sensors, we have to have an onboard computer, and we have to have a way to issue commands to the motor, both the servo motor and the drive motor. So I'm going to talk about uh, how each of those elements work. Um, maybe let me also cover a little bit about some features of why we choose this 110 chassis and you know why is it so realistic. Uh, it has a very low center of gravity, which is generally a good thing. So um, I'll sh I think I've showed you some videos in the introduction of this course where the wheels of the cars are you know coming off the ground because we are turning at such a high speed uh, that sort of the centrifugal core uh, force is uh, is lifting the outer wheels off the of the racing surface. Um, and that's despite the fact that this car has a low center of gravity. In fact, the, the clearance is just a few millimeters. And so when you put all the uh, 
the sensors and all the uh, you know compute and the lidar stuff on top it weighs it down and sometimes the the bottom actually starts touching the ground so we have to add some um, uh, you know more stiffer suspension to to take care of that problem uh, this car is biased uh, very well. So like I said, if you look at the length of the car along this longitudinal axis, uh, bulk of the weight is in the center of this axis, right? So um, the front and the rear assembly uh, weigh nearly about the same. And this is the part, which is the metal part, which weighs a lot. Along with the battery pack, the weight is also evened out along the lateral axis. So that leads to pretty smooth behavior and stable cornering, which is a good aspect to have for a high-speed race car. The shocks or the suspension on this car are actually filled with oil, right? So uh, they are not some gimmick plastic parts. They are functional parts, just as you would find on a full-scale car. And you can adjust many, make many, many adjustments. You can see here, we've added a spacer uh, to uh, make a small adjustment to the suspension in this image. The rear wheel axle of the car has an actual differential box, just like you would find in a real car. Uh, if you're not familiar, the role of a differential is very simple. Uh, as the car goes around a curve or a corner, um, the inner and the outer wheels cannot spin at the same speed because uh, otherwise, you know, uh, they will either cause a torsion stress on the axle, a rigid axle, which connects them, uh, or one of the wheels will have to slip if they are turning at the same rate. Because when you make a corner, the inside wheel has to turn slower than the outside wheel. So a differential is a gear mechanism which makes that happen. So it automatically splits the drive to the wheel appropriately to make sure there is no slippage and the drive is distributed to the outer and the inner wheel uh, through the differential. Uh, then the drive is distributed to the front wheels through this drive shaft. It's a telescoping uh, universal joint drive shaft. Uh, it's one of the key pieces on the car, it gets damaged quite often when you crash. And so uh, we have to uh, always sort of inspect that this drive shaft is in good shape. You can see in this image, the wheel shows the travel in the suspension. This is both for all wheels. There's a lot of um, play in the suspension, which gives you a lot of room to set up your car for a lot of turns or you know, for a left bias turn or right bias turn or for a straight uh, race setup and things like that. And like I said, you can go in and adjust the suspension by using string, uh, springs, which are of different uh, stiffness as well. Then the most important part of uh, this understanding how this car is different from uh, a regular robot that you may use uh, for your research uh, is that this car has realistic steering, which is uh, often called Ackerman steering, right? So Ackerman steering is how road vehicles also operate and uh, in a simple picture the steering operates as what is shown on the right hand side there are actual linkages which can turn each wheel uh, to an appropriate wheel steering angle so to translate the steering angle into the turning of each wheel through the series of these is links um, and joints uh, and so what this results in the behavior is, and this is all you need to know really, that Ackerman steering or Ackerman adjusted steering in robots, um, what it means is that the robot will turn, when it turns, it will turn with a non-zero uh, turning radius. That means that it's not going to be able to twist at its given location. It will, when it starts turning, there will be a radius at which it will turn. And that depends upon uh, the steering angle uh, being sent to the angle of the wheels at the end of the day, right? There's a limit to which you can turn the wheels and that governs sort of your tightest uh, turning radius, if you will. So this is in a nutshell what is called Ackerman steering. This is as opposed to differential drive robots, which just have, you know, uh, this is like a top view of what uh, you can think of as a turtle bot or a differential drive robot, which just has two wheels and a caster wheel in the front. And you can turn the robot by just turning uh, uh, or uh, giving different values of the drive to the left and the right wheel. And what you can do is you can spin at its position. So you can make zero, zero radius of turn um, maneuvers with differential drive robots, but that's not how uh, your uh, you know, road car works. And similarly, the one-tenth car is also Ackerman steering. So it has a non-zero turning radius, which, uh, uh, which you have to take into account as you design algorithms, because you can't make 
90 degree turns as you would with a differential drive robot. Uh, then there's a bunch of different wheels available for the car. Some are uh, more sort of racing inspired and meant for dirt tracks or outdoor surfaces. And then some are more slick that will, you know, grip the, uh, the floor uh, better, but they sometimes also leave a mark on the floor when the car drifts around. Uh, but there's a bunch of different uh, racing wheel choices also available on the 110 scale. So I, I just showed you the main electrical components on the, let's say the, the chassis of the car, which come out of the box. We don't build these ourselves. Uh, and so this is how they are wired together. Uh, the main thing to note is that for RC, RC toy or RC uh, uh, car, you have a receiver which uh, has an antenna that will talk to your uh, remote control. And then this uh, receiver has multiple channels. Uh, one channel is connected to the server motor. Another channel goes into what is called the electronic speed control. And this converts the uh, kind of the throttle input or the brake input into uh, what are called pulse width modulation or PWM signals. I'll touch upon that in just a second, which goes through the to the actual uh, drive motor on the car. Uh, and there are many other channels. Some are used for monitoring temperature and RPM and other things like that. Uh, but these are the most two which are important to us. And then I told you there's a battery bank that you have to connect to power all of this. So that power is actually going into the electronic speed controller to power the main motor and the server. So here's how the high level view of this uh, uh, you know, connection looks like. So you can see we have the battery. That battery is connected through this uh, Traxxas, control, uh, Traxxas port uh, to the electronic speed control, which is this small blue box right here with the three wires coming out. Uh, so that's this connection from the top to bottom. The electronic speed control has these three uh, you know, high gauge wires, which are now connected to the, the brushless DC motor for the main drive. And then here is the servo motor located. So the first thing we do to make this car autonomous is that we get rid of the uh, stock electronic speed control, right? So we, we replace that ESC box from the previous image with our own custom um, box called a VESC, which stands for Weather uh, Electronic Speed Control. I think Weather is the name of the, the person who prototyped it and sold it first. Uh, just a bit of trivia for you, this electronic speed control uh, has its origins in um, controlling electronic skateboards. So, you know, the, you can imagine a skateboard is also like a, a four-wheel drive uh, uh, remote control car, right? But, but just with a flat surface that you stand on. And so uh, that community developed these custom boards which can give us more precise data and a lot more features than the stock ESC. And so what we do is we replace the stock electronic speed control with this uh, VESC. Uh, and uh, among many things, this VESC has inbuilt sensors. So it has a compass, it has a gyro, and an accelerometer, and all of these um, provide valuable data which help us determine the pose of the car and how fast it is moving and where it is in the world, which direction is it facing. Uh, not only that, uh, because of the origins in sort of skateboarding, um, this piece of uh, hardware uh, also has some capabilities such as regenerative braking. So when you're when you apply brakes or when the motor uh, is in the braking phase, uh, it will use the back EMF and the back current to uh, uh, to store some charge and send, you know, recharge the battery as well for real. Uh, and um, it has very, very fine grained uh, control available. We can do a lot of software configuration. We can do a lot of low level tuning of our PID controller, uh, which we'll get into in its own lecture. Uh, but so at a high level, you, you send the input that I want my car to travel at a certain speed, and then this hardware takes that speed and distills it into the signals that has been to be sent to the motor in order to maintain that speed or track that speed, right? So eventually that speed is going to be sent by a software and not some you know, hard-coded value. So it supports many, many different communication ports. There's a steep learning curve to uh, getting to know all the functionality uh, of the VESC, and so one of the parts of our custom software is a, is a config file. I think it's like a YAML format file, uh, which has all the configurations which are specific to the 110 scale chassis uh, and not you know, for some random uh, skateboard. Then we use a, a NVIDIA Jetson series of uh, GPUs or onboard computer as the main uh, compute platform for our car. Uh, what is shown here is the Jetson TX2 development uh, board. 
uh, and you can see the configuration here it has multiple CUDA cores so you can do parallel processing uh, very very efficiently and you know some algorithms such as uh, particle filter localization that we will study a lot uh, utilize that that GPU capability um, and it has a decent amount of memory and this is you know what houses all of your your software at the end of the day and also interfaces with all of the the different peripherals and the sensors uh, but we don't use this big development board itself so just so that you know I know this image is uh, a little bit low resolution but the the actual uh, board is just this uh, you know part with the heat sink the actual processor i should say uh, and all of this is just a development board so that you can hook up hardware hook up a keyboard and monitor as well you can literally use this as like a ubuntu machine um, or a linux machine but what we do we don't have real estate is of uh, importance on the car right so we can't have such a large uh, um, piece of hardware sitting on the car uh, there's not enough space and also when we crash it leads to you know more likelihood that this board will get damaged so what we do is we just prop out the processor and we hook it up to a different board which is called a carrier board and we use a orbity uh, carrier board which is compatible with the jetson series of uh, nvidia boards uh, and so the role of this carrier board is to not give you additional compute power but it's just uh, exposing the essential ports for the actual processor uh, in a very, very small form factor compared to the, uh, the the dev board itself, right? So this is just a credit card size board. I'll show you some actual pictures in just a second, but um, but yeah, this is one little detail that you will find in our build, that the Jetson is actually hooked onto a carrier board, which is then mounted as the main onboard computer for the F110 vehicle. Then you have two uh, kind of batteries required. So this is the the battery which goes into the battery bay of the chassis to power the drive motor and the electronic speed controller or the VESC in our case. So it's engineered specifically to fit the Traxxas model. It comes with this foolproof Traxxas connector um, that you can only plug in in you know, one orientation because uh, you will fry everything if you, uh, you know, plug it the other way into the, into the VESC. Uh, but this battery is not sufficient to power everything, right? We just added a Jetson uh, and we'll add more sensors and a, a wireless telemetry access point as well. So we need an additional battery to power all the electronic peripherals, which is different from powering the drive motor and the servo. And so we have a, a high capacity uh, uh, um, LiPo battery as well, which is used to uh, power all the electronics, including the NVIDIA Jetson. Uh, because we have a carrier board and we have many, many different peripherals, uh, we uh, also usually add a, a high bandwidth USB 3.0 uh, USB uh, sort of an adapter with multiple USB ports to which different peripherals like camera or the LiDAR will plug into. So the main sensor on our car comes from the Hokuyo family of uh, LIDARs or 2D scanning, uh, laser scanning sensors. And we will have a dedicated uh, lecture on doing perception with LIDARs. How do you localize the car using nothing but LIDAR signals and maybe IMU data? So this particular model is what is called a URG4LX. The, the way to decode the name is uh, um, uh, the 4 LX stands for how, what is the range of this uh, uh, laser uh, range finder. Um, don't quote me on this because I, I don't recall, but I think URG is a universal sort of radar group or something similar to that, which uh, is, is also the name of the ROS node that we use to interface with the, with the LiDAR. It's called URG node. Uh, but I'm not uh, able to recall exactly what URG stands for, so look it up and correct me in the comments if you want. Uh, but so, so we have this uh, 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 2D LiDAR. So inside this, you have a rotating uh, um, laser which is uh, rotating in a 240 uh, degree field of view um, and it's going back and forth and it has some you know, uh, fixed increment at which it shoots a laser, gets the, uh, the reflection back and it's able to determine how far certain things are uh, and also determine you know, the, the reflectivity of those things and, uh, and we'll go into the more details of uh, the data it reports. Uh, but we have other um, different configurations, so you will often find URG 10LX can look up to 10 meters, 4LX can look up to, you know, just, uh, uh, I would say, 5 meters, no more than 5 meters or 4 meters. Uh, and then some of our research cars have 30LX, which can look up to 30 meters. Uh, uh, and so two things, 
two things determine how good or expensive a LiDAR is. One is how far away it can look, and the other is at what speed can it generate that data, right? So how many points can it return at what rate? Uh, and so a combination of those uh, is usually what you require to make a choice of what kind of LiDAR you require. So there's definitely cheaper LiDARs we can use, but they are either too slow for racing purposes or they don't look as far. And finally, uh, I just told you that we have a LiPo battery which will power all the peripherals, um, but we need a way to regulate the voltage that we are sending to the Jetson and other peripherals. And so uh, to do so, we have a very clever device. This is a actual automotive grade DC-DC converter, uh, but it has a software interface to program the output uh, on the output port, right? So it's a very simple device. It has an input port, input side and an output side. I think the, the, the red side is sort of the input and this side with the yellow and the black wire is the output. And it has these pins and it comes with a series of jumpers and a USB port. And you can connect it to a, a software tool and actually program uh, what voltage should appear at the output. And you can connect then, you know, um, an arbitrary source, let's say a 24 volt uh, lit, um, LiPo battery at the input but you can say I want the output to be steady at 12 volts and you can do that in software. So it's a pretty a nifty uh, piece of hardware uh, that we use to make sure that all the devices are powered correctly. And then finally we have on every car, just like the one uh, behind me again, we have a dedicated uh, wireless access point. Now, I would say that some of our cars now in the newer fleets, they just use uh, onboard Wi-Fi of the Jetson itself, and that also seems to work. Uh, but many of the research cars and the coast cars that I showed you the image of uh, in the beginning of this video, they have a dedicated uh, access point on every car. What that means is every car is creating its own network. And so that makes it very easy for you to uh, connect a remote machine uh, to that car's network and then just, uh, you know, SSH into the Jetson and uh, launch the different ROS nodes for the particular lab assignment or the racing mode that you want to do. This is a very high bandwidth dedicated uh, Pico station. Um, it is a little bit of outdated hardware. I don't think uh, they make Pico stations anymore. We have played around with different access points as well, uh, but uh, we are slowly moving away to get rid of these uh, access points and just rely on um, the onboard Wi-Fi module, uh, which comes with the latest series of uh, the NVIDIA Jetson boards. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the brushless motor. So here are some more details. You don't need to remember them, but I want to point out a few interesting facts. So uh, here are three things about, uh, about this motor. Uh, the first is the, the middle one is the most alarming in my opinion. So it's a brushless motor, so I'll leave it up to you to, to sort of figure out what's a you know, brushless motor or a brushed DC motor, uh, and there's a difference there, of course. But because this is a brushless motor, uh, it can go uh, uh, up to a ridiculous high RPM of 50,000 uh, know, rotations or revolutions uh, uh, per minute. And so that is very, very high. This is why the car can really go you know, 25, 30 miles per hour uh, out of the box with no additional weight on it. Um, and so it gets heated up very fast as well. Uh, and so, you know, we connect our VESC to this uh, beast of a motor. And um, that's why I said earlier, this car is not your ordinary RC toy. It's really like a, uh, you know, high-end performance or high-performance, high-end uh, uh, vehicle on a 110 scale. So it's ideal for the task of autonomous racing. The other thing I want to point to is this, this curve here, that, this relationship that for every volt that you supply to this DC motor, so every volt of, uh, you know, vo every voltage you give, um, it will result in roughly 3,500 RPM. It's not a linear relationship, but that's about the average uh, at which uh, it works. So, uh, so if you go up to 10 or 12 volts and, you know, itself, uh, it's already rotating at a very, very high uh, RPM value. And then the servo motor itself is also a uh, uh, pretty, pretty solid piece of hardware. It's high torque, so that's what you need for steering. Uh, you don't need high speed. 
you need some speed, but you need precision and torque, right? So why do you need torque? Because the motor has to be able to move all the linkages for the Ackerman steering assembly. And I don't know if you, you realize this or not, but the faster sort of you are going, uh, you know, the uh, it depends upon, it, it will influence how much torque is required to move, right? So if you're standstill, maybe more torque is required, but the faster you are going, little adjustments are required. So it needs to be very precise as well. That's why we show some uh, values of, you know, the transit time um, that you uh, that you can expect or the reaction time that you can expect from this uh, from this motor. It's uh, it's waterproof, weatherproof, and it's a very, very high precise, pre high precision, uh, high torque servo, which controls the Ackerman steering angle. Um, so I want to digress a little bit because I mentioned this uh, a couple of slides ago and also it pertains to both these motors. So the way this functions is what is called pulse width modulation. So this is not a double E or an embedded systems or a mechatronics core. So I will only give you the intuitive surface level view and not maybe the code level or microcontroller uh, view of what PWM is. But the idea is that um, you need a way, just like we saw for the brushless DC motor, if you regulate the voltage, you, it will result in the speed of the motor. And uh, also if you change the polarity of the voltage, it will change the direction of rotation of the motor. So all of this has to be provided by some microcontroller. And so in the car, the VESC, which is the custom electronic speed controller that we add, uh, is going to generate these PWM signals and send them to the motors for precise outputs. Uh, and so essentially what PWM is that it is a way to govern uh, how much voltage from the input is um, passed on or piped through to the output, right? So, so that's really what PWM is. Uh, you have a source voltage and by using or modulating the width or the duration for which the source voltage is switched on or left on, you can govern uh, the average output, uh, which is often less than or equal to the source voltage. So a picture will help clarify what I tried to explain in words. So it's a very simple exercise. This is an oscilloscope. It's hooked up to what appears like a 10 volt uh, DC uh, uh, source voltage. So how do I know that? Uh, well, you can just read off what the channel one voltage is. It's roughly 10 volts. And in this case, so each of these grid cells is like five volts, right? So, the, uh, so if you look at this, this line with the indicator, this is a zero voltage line or the axis. And then uh, for each of these grid cells, the, uh, the height of them uh, is, uh, is roughly uh, or exactly five volts. That's what we have configured the scope to. So this is what 10 volts would look like. And so this is what zero volts look like. So nothing fancy here, just a difference uh, voltage. And you can see the mean value has also changed to zero for this source signal. Um, so now if I say, let me add some circuitry that will keep the source voltage at 10 volts for let's say 50% of, or for half a second, let's say, and then it will keep bring it down to zero for uh, for like one second for for the other half, right? So if you uh, and I'm just you know approximating that it's one second, it could be anything else, right? So but the the shape is what matters here, right? So you see um, we almost have a wave. So if we look at this line right here where you can see my mouse, um, you have ten volts for the same amount of duration as you have zero volts. And then this pattern, the square wave sort of repeats, right? So this is what is called uh, a 50% duty cycle, right? It's, it's, duty cycle is a way of implying what percentage of the time is the voltage being held on. And then uh, uh, by default, 100 minus that percentage is the duration for which it would be off. So for a 50% duty cycle, the interesting thing to note is that the mean voltage of this wave now, right? So previously it was a constant 10 volts or a constant zero. So the mean was equal to the signal. But in the 50% duty cycle, the mean of this wave or the input uh, square wave of this voltage, which has this 50% duty cycle characteristic is five volts, which is exactly half of the peak, which is 10 volts. Right, so now I think you can understand what PWM is. Right? So this is what is a pulse width modulation. We are modulating an input signal, in this case, 
by a 50% duty cycle so that the resulting average voltage that we see is this duty cycle times the peak voltage. Okay, I, ho I hope that makes sense. I know I'm not going over you know, a lot of the fine detail, but uh, I do think you need to know at least something about PWM. All right, so we can see zoomed in, which is an average of five volts, exactly the point that I was making before. So here is another case in which you have 10% duty cycle. So 90% so of the time, the voltage is being pulled to zero and only 10% of the time it's being set to the max, which is 10 volts. And so what we anticipate, uh, so sorry, uh, what we anticipate is that 10% of 10 volts is roughly one, is exactly one volt. And so we expect to see an average or mean voltage of one volt, which is, you know, uh, not exactly what is shown here, but it's it's close enough, right? So uh, 800 millivolts is very close to 1,000 millivolts, which is really one volt. So this is the effect of 10% duty cycle. In fact, I think I have an animation which will show how the mean changes. So you can, um, I'll remove my cursor and let it replay again. So you can see how the bottom right mean voltage changes as the duty cycle increases. I think this visually will explain what is pulse width modulation. So using this, we can modulate how much voltage is being sent to the brushless DC motor, and therefore we can modulate the RPM of the motor, which in turn directly affects how fast the car goes. And I haven't shown you here, but you can also play with the polarity. You can switch the positive and the negative from the VESC because it's a circuit which is between your battery pack and the motor itself. And so you can switch the polarity, which changes the direction of rotation. So you can brake by spinning the motors in the opposite direction if you want, or by just reducing the voltage. Okay, so this in a nutshell is what the VESC is doing. You give it a value, I want my car to run at you know, 2.5 meters per second, which is pretty fast. Uh, and then the VESC will translate that input into a PWM signal and try to maintain a voltage to the brushless DC motor that results in a RPM which will match 2.5 meters per second. And it uses all its sensors to, to ensure that. Okay, so this is, the same, uh, this is the same concept but shown visually. The cyan uh, flat horizontal line shows you how further away you are from zero volt reference. And you can see how it is proportional to the duty cycle. So this is just a little bit more precise um, uh, way to state what I was trying to show you with the real real signal. Okay, so that's what's happening. Okay, so as I said, this is what that slide summarizes. This is applied to the DC motor uh, and the voltage is proportional to the duty cycle and that results in the modulation of the, the speed. Okay, so uh, how this all comes together, it's uh, about ready to conclude this video just to show you uh, how it actually translates into the, the real car. Uh, so you can see, we can think of our uh, F110 vehicle as having uh, these three levels um, uh, of hardware, right? So you have the base, which is the Traxxas 110 scale RC low level chassis. Then you have this plate, and there's stuff uh, which is on the underside of this plate as well, which we call upper level chassis. And then there's the actual electronics or the peripheral, which are the autonomy elements, right? So uh, you have to have all three layers in some sense for this car to function well. So let's take a closer look of how things are connected. Uh, and again, the idea is to just show you how this works. Uh, this is not the only configuration. In this picture, you see the LiDAR uh, is actually a 30LX. Uh, I remember how I showed you how to decode the 4LX, 10LX, 30LX. So it's pretty heavy, it's pretty large. And uh, that's why it's you know the in the front of the car, so it has a very good field of view of whatever is in front of the car. Uh, you will see uh, in in some of the fleets, and also you know the car I have with me, the lidar is mounted at the rear of the top plate, but it's elevated, so it still has a unobstructed view. It's just higher, uh, and that's like again like a design choice based on what else you are mounting on the car. So here's a top view of the of the car uh, which we have uh, in our lab. We have dozens of these. Uh, and so let's identify uh, all this hardware. This is the top view of the NVIDIA Jetson processor. So we've propped that out of the dev board and you can see it quite right from this perspective, but this blue 
sort of a edge here or all these ports, they are from the carrier board onto which the Jetson is actually mounted. Uh, this is our uh, DC to DC converter. So it is powering, as you see, the, the Jetson using this wire over here, the yellow and black wire. And then uh, it's also powering, uh, what is not shown here is the, uh, the wireless access point because it requires a, a different voltage. Uh, then we have connected a couple of things to the Jetson. First is this uh, USB hub, uh, which you can use to connect the LiDAR. The LiDAR just connects through USB in this case. And you can also connect the wireless access point to the Jetson through the Ethernet port. Um, and finally, this DC board also needs some uh, in, uh, power to power all this uh, electronics. So this uh, red and black wire is what is going to get powered from a battery which is mounted at the rear uh, of the car. I'll just show you all of that in just a second. So it's easy enough to identify. This car doesn't have any cameras right now, but we typically mount some cameras uh, out in the front and we can you know, have special mounting holes for that. Uh, and what is not clearly shown is the underside of this plate. So that second layer in the previous image, which has the, the VESC, which is mounted on the, on the undercarriage. Uh, so here's a closer look of the NVIDIA Jetson. So you can see this is the Jetson with the heatsink mostly. And then this blue board uh, with these ports is the, is the Orbity carrier board. Uh, the Jetson is getting powered through the output. Oops, the Jetson is getting powered through the output of the the DC to DC converter. So this this channel is uh, software defined at 12 volts, and then a separate uh, physical wire is used to power uh, the uh, wireless access point mounted at the rear of the car. Um, the wireless access point is then connected to the Jetson through an Ethernet port, and then this port is going to, this USB uh, uh, port is what is the USB hub getting connected to. And then one of the things plugged into the hub is the, is the LiDAR itself. So here's one view of the undercarriage uh, of this top plate. So this piece of hardware is the VESC, this metal sort of box. It replaces the stock ESC, has a better view. Um, so you can see the VESC is right here and um, it has, it is getting connected to two, two different channels. So this channel, if you trace this wire, is where the servo is connected to the VESC. And then uh, here is another channel, which is not that clearly visible. It is also connected to the VESC in one of the ports. Uh, you can see a USB, mini USB cable connected to the VESC. This is what connects the VESC to the Jetson through the USB hub as well, right? So that's why we need to expand the number of ports. So, so in a nutshell, the VESC is connected to both the, uh, the motor, um, the servo, and the, uh, uh, and the NVIDIA Jetson because it needs to accept these values of what speed to maintain and how much to turn. Um, so here are the high gauge wires which will power the, uh, the motor. Uh, and so they are connected to the VESC itself because you know it needs to interface to, to the motor itself. And then there's a separate port which will uh, power the VESC. It is on the other side or you know uh, the side behind what you see on the car. And this is the input part of the DC-DC converter. Uh, it has a fuse to prevent things from shorting out. Uh, but if you trace these wires back and this white piece of uh, uh, sort of hardware here is the, the wireless Pico station, which is not fully shown, but that's what is connected to the ethernet port, which is visible here as well. Uh, but so this DC port needs input power to power all the peripherals, which is the Jetson, the LiDAR, and the Pico station or the wireless network. Um, and so if you look at where these red and black wires go to, on the other side, they go, go to this female five, uh, sort of female uh, five mm um, uh, DC input volt uh, uh, port, uh, which is then connected to you know this battery, which is mounted uh, at the very tail end, almost like a wing of the race car. So this male adapter will power all of the peripherals, and this is what will power the input of the DC volt, and it's software configured to power the Jetson and the uh, and the telemetry. Uh, and on the on the other side, uh, uh, we have so on the side which is opposite to where the VESC is mounted is the battery bay, and it has a usual 
uh, Traxxas port, foolproof Traxxas port, which is connected to this male port, which is powering the, the VESC, which in turn is going to power the uh, brushless DC and the servo motor through those uh, connections that I showed you from the other side. Um, yeah, and so this is again like a, a foolproof connection. So that's mostly uh, on what the hardware or the build of the F110 is. This is you know, not a typical lecture where we go over a lot of concepts. And uh, uh, like I said before, for this year, I'm just teaching this course online. So uh, unfortunately, we won't be using the hardware, but you know, the, the software or the simulator mimics uh, how this hardware has been laid out. So uh, and when I say mimic, it's both in the in the modeling aspects and also in the interface, right? So the the signals you generate in code um, in the software uh, or F110 simulator uh, will use the same ROS topics as the real vehicle. Uh, in fact, one of the things we will discuss in this course is this idea of going from sim to real, or in some cases, real to sim to real. And it's not clear what that means, but what we will show you is how we sometimes run the car in our lab, in the track in our lab. We get the data to build a map. We import the map into our simulator. We run our algorithms, tune our controller in the simulator, and then push it to the car itself. And that's the sim to real gap. And then it will just work uh, without many hassles and very close to how it performs in the simulator. But that's for a different day and a different topic, a different lecture. Uh, this is mostly what I wanted to cover today, the build process. Um, let me go through if uh, there's a few more slides remaining. Here's an example of how the, uh, the suspension is adjusted. So I said two things about the suspension. First, you can see these kind of links with these threads. Uh, they're a little bit out of focus, but here is what you can do for fine tuning the, the camber caster and how your uh, you know, suspension operates. Um, and we'll go into a very end uh, a little bit about what, what these settings uh, uh, mean for the actual race. Uh, but more importantly, you have uh, two aspects to the suspension. You have the actual spring, uh, which we have different types. So you see how these springs are color coded and um, you get like blue, black, red color coded springs and they stand for different stiffness based on how you want your suspension to operate. But that's not the only adjustment you can make. You can add spacers to control the play of the suspension, right? So not only can you control the stiffness of the spring, you can control, you can pre-tension the suspension by adding these spacers of different uh, millimeter thicknesses. Um, and so we often make use of this to make sure that our underbelly of the chassis is not touching the car when we go around corners pretty fast. All right, so, so that's mostly it for this uh, brief video. I wanted to just give you a quick uh, overview of the, the build of the F110 car uh, and an appreciation for what goes behind um, building this car. We are always looking for ways to simplify the wiring, make it foolproof, um, and you know, taking out all the hassles that anyone has to go through to put this car together. And as you can see, it's, it's not that difficult to put this car together, at least physically connecting thing, uh, everything together. There's a separate, uh, sort of firmware part of it, uh, of the build, which I haven't touched upon uh, yet. So uh, so let's stop here for, for this, uh, this lecture video on the F110 build. Um, and now we will jump into the perception planning and control part of this course. We'll begin with uh, looking at uh, how do you localize the car or how do you basically use the LiDAR as the main perception sensor and then we'll add other sensing modalities uh, down the line. So we're getting into the interesting uh, part where you will not start applying all your ROS knowledge to an actual uh, one-tenth scale uh, autonomous vehicle. Uh, and so in doing so, one of the things we'll do over the coming week is have you uh, install the F110 ROS gazebo sim and also maybe provide cloud-based access to uh, an instance which is hold, hosted on our own servers in case you have trouble installing it on your own machines. But we'll get into uh, the nitty gritty of that uh, subsequently. So that was an overview of the build process. I will see you in the next uh, video. Take care.